Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's main event. I'm going to give everyone a couple minutes to trickle in. So sit tight. All right, we are going to get started. Welcome to our first webinar of the season. I hope you all had a wonderful, rejuvenating summer break. Tonight, we are going to be talking about reducing exposure to harmful chemicals in food packaging with our host, Deborah Demolpier. She is the green living expert of the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. Now, before I get too much further, I do want to make sure everyone can hear me. So if you wouldn't mind typing in the chat where you're viewing in from today, I'll read some out loud. I see New York, a few New Hampshire, Charlotte, St. Petersburg, Miami, New Jersey, Minnesota. Fantastic. Thank you all for playing that little game with me. And now I know you can hear me and we can get started. Please use the Q&A function at any time you have a, a question you'd like Deborah to address at the end. And we will do our best to get to as many as possible questions at the end. This is a good time to note. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question in advance. We received a lot of them, and you'll be happy to hear that she answers many of your questions in the webinar itself. So I encourage you to pay attention, stay the whole way, and you'll probably get your question answered as we go along. You will receive a webinar recording at the end once this has concluded with the entire webinar. So don't worry about taking notes too fast. You will have it to review on your own time. And closed captioning is available in English. You may be familiar with the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program, or this may be your first time with us. And if it is, so welcome and thank you for joining us. We are a free doc doctor-recommended expert-led program of and site of resources to help you reduce your risk of cancer, cancer reoccurrence, and chronic illness. If you haven't visited our site already, you can get started anytime at anticancerlifestyle.org. If you have been with us before, you know that we offer so much, I'll just say everything for free. We have compiled free resources like our eBooks, some that our ex green living expert Deborah tonight has written, like the best non-toxic cleaning products, clean cleaning, non-toxic ways to tidy up. These free eBooks and other resources are located on our site. And my friend Nicole will drop a link to these free eBooks in the chat right now if you're interested in exploring them. We also have a complimentary online course that is 10 hours packed with expert-led evidence-based information. You do not have to sit down for 10 hours and take this. You can take this at your own pace, on your own time, whatever day of the week you want to. It's accessible on all devices, your tablet, your computer, your phone, because now we do have an app you can download on your Android or iPhone, and you can learn from anywhere. We do have a Facebook community. If you're not aware, you might be aware or have even heard of us from our larger Facebook profiles, but we have a private Facebook group, which is just a much more intimate way to converse and, and learn from like-minded individuals who are also um, somewhere on their anti-cancer learning journey. We are able to offer all these resources for free and bring in experts like Deborah because of your donations. You might not know that we are a nonprofit and your donations, no matter the amount and all tax deductible, allow us to continue, continue sharing these extremely important programs with everyone. No one should have to access a paywall to, to receive this information and we want it to stay that way and you can help us. So thank you in advance for your donations. Tonight, we have Deborah Demolpier. She is our anti-cancer lifestyle green living expert. Myself, I am Erica Crespo, the social media director for the anti-cancer lifestyle program. And in the background, who I'm sure you'll get to know very well during the, uh, the next hour and a half, is Nicole Jones, our marketing director. 
Deborah is a green living expert, and she created the environment pillar of our anti-cancer lifestyle program. So if you've taken the program, you might be familiar with her face. She was the founder of an environmental green goods store in New Hampshire. In order to choose the cleanest possible products for her store, she spent years researching and vetting companies and products so that her customers could be confident that the brands she carried were the safest available. She is active in the environmental community and is a frequent guest lecturer for cancer support groups and organizations promoting a less toxic lifestyle. So without further ado, Deborah's going to tell us what's what. Take it away, Deb. Thank you, Erica. Um, great to be here and welcome everybody. Um, this is an exciting topic. It's pretty intense, so I will warn you. We're going to cover it um, in a in a very deep manner, but not as deep as it goes. It's very intense. So we'll, I'll keep it as simple, but as informative as possible. So let's get started. So we are talking about food contact materials. Um, it's short for uh, F FCMs. Um, so food contact materials, we'll do that all night. Um, so what are they? It, it's basically packaging, but there's a purpose to them. And so it makes food safer for transportation. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, preserves food quality, and there's lots of ways that they do that. It provides a barrier uh, so that gas and vapors and aromas don't get into the food. Also protects the food from the sun. Uh, there's antimicrobials to protect the food. Uh, it also extends the shelf life uh, so that and it avoids waste. Uh, and of course, it attracts customers with uh, the branding of the packaging. But in this webinar tonight, we're going to mainly focus on uh, packaging, storage, and food preparation. So, so what are the basic types of uh, FCMs? So 34% are paperboard, 27% um, rigid plastic, that's your hard plastic, 11% glass, 10% flexible plastic. And then you have 9% metals, 6% um, are beverage cans, which are, are metals as well. And 3% are other things, bio-based, biodegradable, compostable. So over one third of the FCMs are plastic. But if you add up the plastic coating that's on the inside of um, metal cans or beverage cans, you're talking almost 50% of um, F FCMs are plastic uh, touching your food. So plastic, we're gonna start with plastic. So 60% of the entire world's plastic is used for food packaging. When I saw that statistic, it just blew me away. That's, that's a lot of plastic with uh, ha having to do with food. So, but why should we be concerned? Well, when they've um, analyzed these uh, plastics used for food packaging, they use about 20, they purposely use about 12,000 chemicals um, to make food packaging. Um, not all of them have been thoroughly tested uh, for long-term health consequences. So that's an issue. But when they analyzed other chemicals from food packaging, they found over 30,000 chemicals. That's over twice of intentionally added. But these 30,000 chemicals are what's called unintentionally or non-intentionally added substances. So short, N-I-A-S. So th this is a problem because they didn't purposely use these for packaging, but when they analyze them, there they are. So where do they come from? Well, they might just be that they, they get mixed in uh, when other chemicals come together. It might be from stress or heat. UV might... Um, change the chemical uh, uh, composition of them. And a lot of times they just don't know. Um, but it is a concern because that's a lot of chemicals that weren't intended to be part of food packaging. And then of course, with plastic, you have the problem of what's called microplastics. So those are tiny, tiny pieces of plastic. They're about, they're less than a fifth of an inch, uh, but they get so small that you can't even see them. And um, so that's a problem as well, because microplastics, now that they've looked, are everywhere. They come from all plastics. It's all over the world. It's in our body. And it's become a huge topic um, just fairly recently, actually. So still on the plastics, 
you probably know a lot of the basic plastics because we have the little um, chasing arrow here with the triangle for recycling purposes. And that's a, that's a good way to get started on the different kinds of plastic. So um, plastic number one is your, is your pet plastic. And we know that's, you, that's your, your basic uh, over-the-counter water bottle. Um, please stop buying water bottles, just saying. It's also squeeze bottles, but that's basically what the plastic number one is used for. Plastic number two, uh, your high density polyethylene is typically milk jugs, but it's also the squeezy bottles like mustard and, and um, ketchup and things like that. But they did find that some of those kinds of squeezy bottles actually had PFAS lined in them. So yes, it's plastic, but then they went and added another chemical. We'll talk about PFAS in a minute. That is short for um, poly and per flora alkaline substances. It's, it's a big topic, but we'll go over that. And then also under number two are tea bags, those nylon plasticky tea bags. So that's a, that's a problem as well. Plastic number three is your polyvinyl chloride, not used a lot in plastic in, in food packaging, but a little bit. So it's the clear plastic that might be put over like quick foods like pizza or something like that. Might be in the caps and lids. Um, it still might be in some cling wraps uh, on the commercial level, like in your grocery stores, they often will use the cling wrap to go around, you know, the chicken or something like that. Um, so that can also be a PVC plastic. And, and that's very much a concern uh, because there's a high uh, leaching and uh, of that um, coming from that kind of plastic. Um, plastic number four is going to be your other kind of your milk hard cartons, kind of like your Tetra Plaques, uh, Tetra Packs. Uh, it's also bread bags, Ziploc bags, hot and cold beverage cups are lined with um, uh, plastic number four. Uh, that's your low density polyethylene. Uh, takeout containers, also some uh, shrink wraps that, that go around food so that you can freeze it. It's also the base for some black plastic. And you might see the black plastic like in the trays or um, takeout containers. Sometimes uh, frozen foods will have black plastic, uh, sometimes the lids on, on certain things. And there's a big concern with the black plastic because that often comes from recycled material. That sounds good initially, but actually some, sometimes that recycled content comes from electronics. And so from that, we get a lot of contamination of things like flame retardants and stuff like that. And yes, again, that's problematic because it, then we ingest it. Uh, plastic number five is your PP, your polypropylene. Uh, um, and that's going to be in like your yogurt and your sour creams and your ready to eat foods. And yes, your K cups. So, um, and that's for the little instant uh, coffee maker there. So your K cups, uh, I think they've publicized recently that they were using recycled plastic and that always sounds great. But sometimes again, you have a lot of contamination with the recycled plastic. So, you know, that's a little bit of a heads up. And plastic straws also use plastic number five. Uh, plastic number six is your polystyrene. That's your typical styrofoam uh, coffee cup that you might have or styrofoam takeout container. And yes, it does leach styrene and styrene is a carcinogen. So that's a concern. Uh, plastic number seven is anything that's not plastic one through six. So that can be a lot of different kinds of plastics. It can be your hard plastics, your, your Nalgenes, your, your Triton, polycarbonates, your water filters that, that are not glass. PLA is a, is a type of plastic. It's kind of the new kid on the block, the regrettable substitute that is showing issues. Things like nylon and all sorts of other kinds of plastics are listed under um, the number seven. So lots going on in the um, plastics uh, recycling world here. But there are other materials and additives also linked to chemicals of concern. So here we have a, a nice little list and it starts with antimicrobials and those are basically things um, to keep the, the bacteria down and stuff like that. And they can either be natural or synthetic chemicals. The natural ones are actually kind of cool. Um, mineral oils are petroleum-based and they're found in adhesives and plasticizers and stuff. 
you have UV protectors and it, they kind of act like a sunscreen. Um, inks and color developers, um, those are on top. Those are like on the outside of packaging and believe it or not, they will leach right through the cardboard and into your foods. You have labels that are printed and they'll, they'll be labels like on a piece of fish or chicken or something like that. And the ink that's used for them uh, might be BPS, for instance, and that goes right through the plastic into the foods. Uh, you also have, for labels, you have stickers that are on apples or avocados or something like that. And believe it or not, they did a study and there are a whole bunch of phthalates that go from the stickers into the apples, into the uh, apple flesh, and actually right through the avocado skin. So that comes from labels. Uh, you have anti-static uh, chemicals that are used so that the stuff doesn't stick to the inside of the, the bag, whether it's a cereal bag or, or the things that you tear off so that you can get bulk foods or something like that. Uh, straws are a, a concern, especially the plastics, because they're going to create mi microplastics. But your paper ones are lined with that chemical PFAS that we're going to be going over. Silicone is sort of the new kid on the block that tried to replace or is trying to replace a lot of plastic items, um, but they're starting to find uh, problems, not necessarily with the silicon that is used to make the silicone, but what they're finding is all the additives you have to add to it in order to make the shape or to make it flexible or make it not flexible and, and that kind of stuff. So that is showing um, some cell damage and hormonal changes in terms of the research there. And then lastly, we have nanoparticles. Those are tiny, tiny little uh, particles, um, often to keep the food uh, as an antibacterial. Some chemicals used for that are, are titanium dioxide, silver nanoparticles, um, and some other ones. Uh, and they basically try and protect the food. So there are thousands of potential uh, different chemicals, so many uh, chemicals of concern. You know, you have the PFAS uh, category, um, and we'll be talking uh, more about all these different things. So lots to think about here. So this is a nice little graphic because it sort of emphasizes uh, what, what we're doing tonight. This comes from a study and they talked about the three basic kind of packaging, the paper, plastic, and metal. And then they listed um, the, the most common um, chemicals that, that leach from there that they found. Uh, even though there are hundreds and thousands more. So basically from the paper, most of it that, that was of concern was again, this PFAS uh, category. And it's basically to prevent absorption of, of the liquids, which kind of makes sense. Uh, in the plastic, uh, phthalates, um, which is a, a family of uh, chemicals used to make plastic kind of soft and pliable. Uh, that's the, the biggest concern. Um, and then in metal, you had the, the bisphenol um, uh, category, the phenyl uh, uh, family of chemicals. And so, you know, you've heard the BPA and the BPS and the BPF. And so those are some of the things that are in the metal. So this is a graphic that came from a scientific study. So you can see that we're not the only ones talking about this, but I um, just wanted to share that with you. So what's the, what's the big deal about all this? Well, it's because the chemicals don't stay in the packaging and that's, that's the problem. So the little graphic on the left shows the little piece of cheese. And basically you have the chemicals, chemicals going from the packaging into the cheese. And that's called migration or leaching. And there are a couple, there's uh, four uh, things that can actually influence this process of migration and actually make the migration or leaching greater. So cooking things at a higher temperature or exposing, exposing things to a higher temperature, whether it's a microwave or your water bottle sitting in a car, that's going to increase migration. You also have something called contact time. So if something is sitting you know, in a can for two years before you use it, that's a lot of contact time. Or if you bring that piece of cheese home and it's sitting in that container uh, for a week, that's a lot of contact time, unless you, uh, instead of bringing it home and rewrapping it in a glass container. Uh, then you have what's called portion size. So you have um, the smaller portions has 
a ratio of surface area to content. So when you have a small portion size, you have greater exposure. So that increases the migration. Uh, and then you have the what is the food made up. So things like Fatty foods and acid foods will promote more migrating of the chemicals into the food. So we'll talk more about that as we go. But I wanna do a little bit of science before we keep going here. So, because it's important um, to keep in mind some of this because it helps you decide uh, which, what are you gonna buy in the future? And it, and it gives you some guidance to make those decisions. So the first one we're talking about is, just so you know, the exposure routes. So you have the three greatest exposure routes of toxins are ingestion, inhalation, and skin contact. So obviously tonight, it's mostly talking about ingestion. Um, the most important uh, one we're going that you should keep in mind is the second one, and it's a formula. It's the risk to health formula. It's a, it's a basic toxicology thing. And risk equals exposure times hazard. So how bad is something, how hazardous is it, times exposure? Exposure is the key because we can vary exposure by either the choices we make, letting something stay in contact or that, again, that contact time. Uh, so the exposure is very important. How often do you eat it? Do you eat it three times a day? three times a month, three times a year. So this is, this is a really, really important formula for deciding, well, how risky is that to my health, okay? Then there's a, uh, a, an old saying in toxicology called the dose makes the poison. And that kind of makes sense actually for most chemicals. So for instance, alcohol, you know, we have a little bit, it's not a poison, it's, it's okay. Uh, but if we have too much alcohol, it becomes a poison. It becomes a danger to our health. And that's true for a lot of uh, chemicals and metals. However, there is this one category called endocrine disrupting chemicals. And uh, we, we say EDCs for short. So you'll he hear me talking about that. Um, and these are chemicals that don't go by the dose makes the poison um, saying. So in fact, what happens is what happens is that the science has shown that the EDCs actually um, will affect your hormones at very, very low exposure levels because our own hormones function at a very low, small level. And so even these chemicals can do a lot of uh, damage at very, very low dosages. So basically low exposure does not always equal safe levels, especially when it comes to EDCs. But really zero in on that second one, that formula, risk to health equals exposure times hazard. Um, the other thing that comes up um, with regard to this is a lot of people will say, well, uh, because of the exposure times the hazard, what about detoxing? How do, how do I get rid of all this stuff that's in my body? And there really isn't a lot that you can do to hasten it. Body's going to do what it does in terms of metabolizing. Things are every single chemical is metabolized a different way by the body. Some are short, some stay in our body a long time, and you can't do a whole lot about that. Um, so, but the biggest thing you can do is not be exposed in the first place. So that's where moving forward, making decisions about this is so important. So. Okay, but are these exposures actually harmful? Yes. So a study on plastic, one study found over 10,000 chemicals used in plastics. Of those 10,000, they determined that 2,400 chemicals were of concern. And when a scientist says chemicals of concern, that's a, that's a red flag. That means they've, they've noted it and there needs to be a lot more research. And typically from my experience, is that what the research just keeps coming in and yes, they were right from the beginning. So that's, that's um, a quarter of all the chemicals um, used in plastics that are chemicals of concern. So um, and a lot of these are, again, the EDCs, the endocrine disrupting chemicals and the little um, uh, picture on the right here shows the basic, uh, the hormone system there and the different glands and organs that um, make our uh, hormones work in our body. Uh, and these EDCs can interfere with, with all of those organs. 
and they can interfere with uh, reproductive organs, and that affects puberty, growth, fertility, uh, and a lot more. And it can also increase the risk of cancer. Uh, some of the common EDCs are phthalates. That's a big, uh, a moderately big uh, family of uh, chemicals, plastic chemicals. BPA, BPS is the phenyl family group. Then you have me heavy metals. They are also can be EDCs, pesticides, the PFAS, and the flame retardants. All of them can have EDC uh, properties. So this is from another study, and they were looking at EDC exposure uh, just in general. Where, where do all these uh, EDC ex D EDCs exposures come from? And they determined that actually food was the highest. So you can see in, in the nice little graph on, on the right, pesticides is 9%. Industrial uses is 31%. What does that mean? That's like factories, buildings. Do you live near a factory? construction sites, things like that. Uh, household fragrance, personal care was only 21%, but the food additives and contact substances was 38%. So food packaging matters, okay? So um, another, again, from another scientific uh, article. But narrowing down, there are two categories uh, of um, chemical families that are most in food packaging, and that's your BPA or uh, phenyl ca category, and then your phthalates. And there, are, I don't know, there may be, I think there are almost 30 different kinds of phthalates uh, in that family. And uh, BPA is a major endocrine disruptor. It is associated with a lot of cancers. Uh, it's predominantly in canned foods and canned beverages, sorry, canned beverages. They've actually replaced a lot uh, of the canned foods. A lot of the replacements have been BPS and BPF, and those are just basically kissing cousins to BPA, and we call those regrettable substitutions because basically they're as bad. Uh, in the phthalate category, um, uh, that is predominantly in PVC plastic number three, so we talked about that. So that's going to be in um, your cling wraps. Even though some cling wraps have switched the kind of plastic, they still put phthalates in it or a phthalate substitute. And that substitute is also showing um, some endocrine disruption. And again, these are linked to breast cancer, fertility issues, asthma, obesity. Uh, and phthalates are also on those fruit labels that I talked about and in food packaging, um, fast food packaging. So uh, let's see. Yes. Okay. So this little graphic is from another scientific study. Okay. Uh, and this, this study showed strong evidence of endocrine disruption associated with exposures, again, from BPA or bisphenols and phthalates. And look at all the things that, that, that this study showed that happened. So you have metabolic alterations, reproductive disorders, neurological problems, and of course, uh, hormone-dependent tumors. So this was a huge study, and it really kind of hit home uh, what BPA and phthalates can do to our body. So some plastic products are more toxic than others. So this isn't necessarily a black and white subject. If you want to say they're better, um, or less toxic or more toxic. We have a nice little uh, graphic here for that. So on the left, you see the green. It doesn't mean go, it just means it's less toxic. So it starts with PET, which is the plastic number one, and plastic number two are considered the safest, okay? But just because it's it's still plastic and it still has microplastics so that, that uh, slough off. Um, then you have a PP, which is your polypropylene. So that's your plastic number five. Plastic number four is getting in the middle near, near that little exclamation mark. So um, that's your plastic number four. And then PS is your polystyrene. So now we're starting to, okay, you need to avoid this. And the PLA, which is your plastic number seven, and it ends with the red. That means don't go there. And that's your plastic uh, number three. So that is considered the worst plastic. 
So, um, and all of these also have other additives and all sorts of uh, other things besides just their base uh, composition of the plastic. So let's talk about microplastics. So even though we just saw a slide where something's less toxic and maybe the, the plastic's a little bit better for you or safer, all plastics, period, no discussion, create microplastics. And this study, um, in a ni another nice little graph, shows all the different body parts or all the different complications or, or uh, concerns that the microplastics uh, created being exposed to these various chemicals that are, are going to leach or migrate from the, the microplastics. The other concern that this study came up with is that microplastics are kind of sticky. So they found out that actually heavy metals and diseases actually stick to these microplastics and kind of go along for the ride. So again, you can inhale these, you can ingest them. Uh, and these microplastics that get so small that you can't even see them, Yes, they have been found in every organ of the body, including the brain, uh, the blood. They found it in the placenta, the fetus, the testes, the semen. So basically, the plastic's going everywhere. Um, and, and we're not talking a few. We're talking thousands. Uh, you can have hundreds to thousands of microplastics in one bottle of water. I'm not making that up. Um, we don't know if if they stay there forever, if they come out, we know microplastics come out of our poop. So we know some of it comes through, but we don't know how long it's gonna stay inside and we don't know how to get rid of it. So this is, this is kind of new science in the last 10 years, it's been really exploding, but no matter what kind of safer plastic you think you're using, all plastics create micro, microplastics, period. No more discussion about that. Sorry. So then we had um, a new newish product, silicone products that have um, replaced a lot of uh, plastics. Um, and we thought it was a, a, a great replacement when it first came out, even though I was a little skeptical. Um, is it better than some plastics? Sure. But the research is showing also some concerns about it. So silicone is made from silicon, which it is a natural resource. It's the, all the additives that they have to put in it, the colorants, the stabilizers, the things to make it flexible, all the stuff that they have to add to it, those are the chemicals of concern that are, are showing um, their head. So in this study, 32% of the silicone products showed moderate, moderate cytotoxicity. So that means cell damage. 84% uh, of the products showed notable that's notable hormonal activity. So endocrine disrupting um, activity. So um, what, they, what they came to conclude was it's that this is you know, going down the same road that plastics is. Maybe not as bad, but it certainly isn't the wonderful thing that they thought silicone products were going to be. So this is, this is a recent research and it, it really, um, makes you pause uh, using all those silicone products. And remember, those are utensils. Those are the, the little baggies now that they come. They kind of replaced the Ziploc thing. So a lot of things are coming in silicone uh, these days in the kitchen. So what about metal? So um, metal uh, FCMs are mostly made from stainless steel, plated tin, and of course, aluminum. And they come in the form of caps and lids and bottles, you know, trays that are frozen or, or, or uh, come, you know, with a, a lasagna in it or something like that. Bags, wraps, and of course, things like aluminum foil. Uh, most cans, caps, and lids and bottles are lined with a type of plastic to prevent the corrosion. So that's whether it's your canned foods, your caps, and of course, your beverage cans. As you can see from this experiment, they dissolve the aluminum away from the Coke can, and you're basically left with a plastic bag. So that's what you're, that's what is against the fluid, the drink, what you're drinking right there. So again, think microplastics um, when you see these kinds of things. And then we have paper as a food contact material. 
And this is where we can talk about PFAS. So that is your polyperfluoroalkaline substances. The nickname is called forever chemicals because they are around right now. We, we are saying forever. Scientists are saying, well, they don't think it, it's going to break down until after a thousand years. So the reason that all of a sudden we are uh, aware of all these PFAS is because they are for, forever chemicals. They've been in, in um, products for decades now. And because they never go away, they're building up. So they're everywhere. They're you know in all animals, they're in the soil, they're in the water, they're in our foods, they are everywhere. And they just keep getting more and more and more because they don't go away. So they're, they're known for grease, grease proofing, um, stain proofing, waterproofing. So they have this slippery thing that's used as the Teflon, you know, the Teflon uh, cookware. Uh, that's what they're famous for. So on the right here, you have a little graphic. So it's, it's very much used in fast food containers. And when they tested them, over 50% of the, just the little bread wraps uh, had, were lined with PFAS, 38% in the cardboard, 20% uh, in the paperboard. Um, but paper cups don't have the PFAS, okay? Paper cups are lined with polyethylene, um, which is a plastic. Uh, is it better than PFAS? Maybe. Um, but you're also going to be ingesting microplastics uh, when you use that. So the PFAS is linked to serious health risks, including cancer. Um, when uh, in terms of straws, um, we went from plastic straws and we thought, oh, great, we'll go to paper straws. That's a great thing for the environment. But it turns out when they tested these paper straws, 36 out of 38 companies or brands were lined with PFAS. So it kind of defeats the purpose of going to paper if you're going to now use a forever chemical. And yes, you do ingest it when you drink from a paper straw. Uh, so just so you know, metal straws are the way to go or glass straws. Uh, paper cups, the, the concern, again, they're lined with polyethylene. Um, that is going to be your plastic number two or five. Um, sorry, two or four. Uh, and you know, again, that's the safer plastic, but you're going to get um, uh, microplastics uh, for sure on that. And there is um, uh, also migration of chemicals of concern. So. so what about glass? Uh, that is your safest food contact material, uh, but it breaks. But you can get um, used to using it. Uh, there are a couple of different types of glass that we use, uh, at least two of these um, in food contact uh, materials. So <clears throat> type number one is mostly used for like canning jars or storage materials or your heavy Pyrex that's been you know, tempered that you're going to bake something in. Uh, type two really isn't used in, in food um, too much. That's mostly used in pharmaceuticals. Uh, type three is your soda lime glass. And that's what's used mostly in uh, food packaging. So your tomato sauce and, you know, your mustard and all the stuff that's going to come in glass is going to be your soda lime glass. Also, um, under the glass category are the old, you know, crystal decanters. And just a heads up, those old, <clears throat> sorry, uh, crystal decanters might have lead in them. And there's been a, a lot of um, concern about that because They've really come down hard on lead exposure. I'm sure you've, you've read about that. So uh, just so you know, uh, let's stay away from the uh, crystal decanters uh, if you can. So glass is pretty simple. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but there is good news. So there are advancers, advances in safer food packaging. It's kind of cool what they're using. So they are using plant-based solutions and a lot of them are like after using stuff like rice husks or pressed palm leaves and bamboo, maybe you've seen them, even hemp products, cellulose. Um, wrappers, cellulose is like, think celery, you know, that's a cellulose uh, product. Um, and so then they're making them convenient and compostable and safe options. So companies really are, you know, jumping on the bandwagon. And they're even doing edible packaging possibilities. That's a little bit more in the future, but look for it. It's kind of cool, but we've been doing ice cream cones that we can eat for a long time. So it is possible, but 
uh, there are some advances and hopefully that's going to be good for the future. But I, I do want to touch on a few um, specifics because we get a lot of uh, questions about this. You know, you can get used to, or a lot of people are used to using the cling wrap. And a lot of that is an issue and the companies are trying to change. So the companies on the left, you can see, you know, they're trying and they, they have the nice green stuff and clad wrap has 50% plant-based, but you know, they don't tell you the rest of it is still the same old plastic. So it really kind of doesn't matter. Um, Saran wrap is PE plastic or polyethylene plastic, but they still might add phthalates or the phthalate substitute DEHA to it to make it pliable and sticky or wrap it around. Um, so, uh, and that substitute again is a, a slightly regrettable substitution. It is, it is showing tumors in mice and stuff like that. So it's it's not um, you know off the hook it by any means. But there are some that are uh, pretty safe. On the right, you have a company called BioBags. And they make sandwich bags and sort of the food storage and the and the clingy stuff. And it's it's kind of cool. It's made from uh, starches from uh, GMO free crops. So that's kind of nice. Does it work as well as the cling wrap and the glad wrap? No, um, but it is safer. So sometimes we can't have our cake and eat it too. But just so you know that these products are out there. Compostable products ha have really taken off and you see it, uh, you know, it's a, sometimes it's a marketing thing. They'll take something that's supposedly compostable and then line it with plastic or PFAS. But if you want something that's truly compostable, you can look for a logo. So the logo in the US is in the left upper corner, the BPI. And so that's kind of nice. If it has that, it, it, that means it's safe to compost. So it's not gonna have those extra chemicals. But the thing is, it's not composting for your backyard. It's composting for a high heat facility. So usually, usually that's muni municipalities, um, but a lot of cities compost now. So, that, so that's good. You can use it for that. If you were to use it in your backyard, it might take uh, quite a while before it actually composted. But anyway, this is a part of the future for um, uh, food packaging and compostable items. So it, we're making progress. We're getting down into a summary here. So the good and the bad of food contact materials. So just, just the quickie, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but just to review, you have the materials on the left. So you have plastic paper, bio-based, a multi-layer, remember the Tetra Packs, um, metal, glass, silicone, and compostables. And you have your pros, and then you have your cons. But what I want you to notice is in the cons, you have still a lot of plastic issues. So you have uh, microplastics, plastics. Uh, so you have five different things here that still have plastic touching your food. And again, that's creating microplastics that you're ingesting. And just think of that little graphic of all the health issues that come about with that. And so what you choose really does matter. But this little, this little chart here is just a nice thing for the pros and cons. Um, and again, just a reminder, you're going to get all this in an email and you can go back and look at the slides in more in detail. So what you can do to avoid exposure to harmful chemicals in food contact materials. Here we go. We have some solutions. So making safer choices in terms of grocery and beverages. So you want to uh, try and get basically fresh food when you can, um, instead of putting it in plastic. And it drives me crazy when our local grocery store wraps the broccoli in shrink stuff, drives me nuts. Um, but try to avoid it if you can and still get fresh. Uh, bulk pur purchases are great. You can bring your own containers and, and buy bulk. Uh, you can support your local farmers. Um, we, ha we have lots of farm stands where I live. Uh, and, and also CSAs are terrific. They don't usually wrap things. So that's kind of nice. Um, really, really try and use glass whenever possible. I know it breaks, but that's just the way it goes. Uh, and especially for beverages. Remember the contact time. 
Remember the exposure time, beverages, because it's fluid and it's touching versus something dry. Your beverages are going to have a lot more leaching and migration uh, than any other um, kind of uh, food stuff. Uh, choose dried foods over canned foods whenever an option. I know people, you know, the big thing is the beans, right? So, and you can get dried beans. You can make them from scratch. It, I know it takes a little bit of time, but all you do is bring them to a boil the night before. They go soft. Maybe you boil. You don't have to stir them. They, they just cook. But if you make a nice big batch, then you can freeze them in a jar, uh, a glass jar, and you don't, because it's not going to break if it's if it's a bean, right? It's it's not a fluid that's going to expand, um, and so that way, instead of taking can off the shelf, you're taking a jar out of out of the freezer, and that might help reduce the canned options. But I, I get the the issue with with choosing dried foods over canned options. Um, when you're at a, a large grocery store, or even a, a meat facility, ask the Ask for butcher paper, not freeze dried, not freezer paper, but butcher paper. Uh, you can wrap your meats and your fish in that. And the uh, butcher paper is the is the safest way to go. Still paper, but they don't really line it with anything, so that's kind of nice. You want to avoid cling wrapped cheeses, meats, and and but if you have to buy it, just bring it home and either rewrap it or just like cheeses actually do best in glass containers that have a cover on them. They don't need to have something contact um, with them. Cheeses actually like a little um, air exposure and they keep longer that way. Uh, you can make soups from scratch instead of opening up a can. Uh, but if you need something quick, it's actually better to get boxed versus canned because the, the boxed ones have um, the, the polyethylene plastic against the food versus your cans, which might have more endocrine disrupting chemicals or BPA. It depends on the, on the food manufacturer of the cans. And that's a, that's a whole nother subject, but that's a moving target. Um, but uh, I, I will say right now, in regards to canned foods, the number one company that is, is the safest is the company Eden. So if you, if you need to get your canned beans or other things, um, look for that company. So it's E-D-E-N, Eden. Anyway, okay, keep going. So choose larger packages to reduce exposure. Remember that surface to content ratio uh, and freezer wrap using, okay, silicone parchment is still better than freezer wrap, which is plastic. So again, lesser of two evils. Um, or you can just freeze it in, uh, a, a, again, a glass container if that, if that works for you. So those are kind of some of the basic um, choices that really make a difference. Again, you're trying to reduce that exposure and it makes a difference when you multiply it times the habits or in order to get your risk of health. These are the actions that you can do to help that, to reduce that risk. Then we have making choices, okay, in the kitchen and consumption. Um, so microwave with caution, please do not use any plastic. Remember, heating increases leaching and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and even though a frozen food will say, microwave safe, it's not, okay? So please, you can scoop it out and put it into a, a glass container or, or on something ceramic and microwave it if you have to. Uh, limit takeout foods uh, or fast foods if you can. If you're going to get a doggy bag or something, uh, transfer it to a safer container with, when you get home or bring your own, you know, people do that. Uh, you can bring your own uh, stainless steel uh, coffee container or thermos uh, for hot beverages on the go. Um, that certainly is a great thing to do and you're not wasting. Um, with regard to ceramics at home, a lot of people use ceramics for uh, holding foods or, or uh, baking or, or, you know, just storing food. Just make sure it's not old and vintage. If it is, you might want to do a lead test uh, because some of those uh, old vintage items, or if they're if it's hand pottery or some handmade ceramic, sometimes there is lead in the base. So just a little caution. Uh, go ahead and test it um, with a tester. Easy to find on Amazon. Um, sorry about that. Uh, watch out for misleading marketing terms. So you have your, you know, BPA free or your PFOA free or your PFAS free. 
well, don't tell me what's not in it. I want to know what's in it. And that's a huge marketing thing. Uh, and again, they will use a lot of regrettable substitutions that are, are, are as bad or nearly as bad. So just watch out for those uh, magic marketing terms. Um, swap plastic and paper straws with stainless steel and glass. Those are good options. Uh, you can store food in glass, ceramic, safe ceramic, or stainless steel at home. Uh, you can get glass stuff all over the place now. You know, the Pyrex, and, and they're in all kinds of stores, uh, all kinds of shelves. They're in, they're in thrift stores, easy to get. Uh, even if you have a glass bowl, just put a plate on it. You know, that acts as a lid. So easy, easy, easy to store food in glass. And as a general rule, basically minimize plastic and canned products. And remember, because anything that's plastic, anything, anything, anything is going to um, make microplastics that you will ingest. Uh, and that's a problem. So um, just a couple of things still on this um, uh, slide here uh, with storage. So things like you know, lettuce, we typically will grab a plastic bag for that. But my old auntie, she didn't, she used a, a damp tea towel. And so she dampened the tea towel, rolled the lettuce up in it, and it, that lettuce would keep for days. So little tricks like that are kind of cool. Uh, never heat in vacuum sealed glass, bags. Again, we don't, we don't want to heat up plastic, anything that's touching our food. But I know vacuum sealed bags of, of food stuff is, is very popular. Uh, so just, you know, again, cut it open, transfer it to another um, container. But the, one of the most important things to do, and not most important things, but another important thing to do, the, all the things we've talked about is what affects us. But we need to also consider the bigger picture. So how do we change all this packaging? Well, we can change it by getting involved, vote on reg, uh, regulation, uh, see who's who's working at the state level to change these things. A lot of states are actually doing things way before federal uh, regulation or the FDA. We have states like Maine and New York and California. They're, they're way ahead of the game, starting to ban things, and um, they're getting some things done. You can also support organizations like EWG, the Environmental Working Group. Uh, Silent Spring is another organization, Beyond Plastics. So you can also get involved so that all of this changes, so that we stop using all these chemicals, or at least we get more research and regulation so that we can um, be safer with all, the, uh, with all the food packaging, since we need to eat all the time. So that was a lot, um, lots to digest here. So I hope you're not feeling overwhelmed, but really it, it little steps can make a big difference. So I love this quote here. Each step you take reveals a new horizon. You today have taken the first step. Now I challenge you to take another step. So baby steps, you have a list of things to do. We have some um, great uh, um, things that Nicole's going to put in. I think in the in the chat box, we have some nice graphics, some nice printouts for you as well that you can keep handy. Um, but basically, this is doable. We can reduce the exposure. So remember that little formula we talked about? And we can make a big difference. We're not going to get rid of everything because our whole earth is exposed. But again, if we go by that special formula of risk, we can reduce it and we can be um, healthier and have a, a more healthy future. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for coming tonight. We're going to do Q&A later and take it away, Erica. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Deborah. Um, we really do have a lot more power than we probably realize. So before we get to the Q&A, I just want to remind folks that if you loved learning from Deborah tonight, there's more where that came from, both in our environment module of the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program, but also in her eBooks like The Healthy Kitchen You Might Be Interested or the Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals eBook, both things she talked about during this webinar that she really goes in depth in, in both of these free eBooks. And then there's our food contact materials guide that you can also find on our site. It's a handy guide. You can pin to your bulletin board or put on it with a magnet to your fridge. 
really help you keep in mind. And Nicole will drop the links to these two things in the chat. And please, like I said, this is the first event of the season. We have a lot more where this is coming from. Our next webinar is B uh, Busting Cancer Food Myths with our registered di dietitian, Crystal Pace, on Tuesday on October 17th. Free RSVP if you are interested. Nicole will drop an RSVP link in the chat. We also have coming up our seven day diet kickstart. Be on the lookout in your newsletter and on social media for when to get started. It is all free and it is 15 minutes a day. You'll be led by our registered dietitian on each of the themes you see on the calendar below. And at the end of this week, you're going to feel better and you're going to know how to progress towards a healthier lifestyle as we soon it'll be 2024. <laughs> if you enjoyed this webinar, don't worry, we are getting to Q&A in one second. If you did enjoy it, though, I invite you to take our survey. It helps us improve, um, to it helps us to think of new topics. So please take our survey. If you have a few minutes, we greatly appreciate it. And now it is time for questions. All righty. Okay, give me one second. Let me bring up. We got a lot of live questions, it looks like. Thank you all for participating. Okay, Deborah, is cork safe to use? Oh, good question. Yeah, as long as they don't put a plastic lining on it or coating. <laughs> but yeah, no, cork is great. Um, so, you know, usually your cork uh, little stoppers and stuff like that. And and um, yeah, I, I even have a cutting board where half, one side of it is cork. So yeah, it's a, it's a super product. Fantastic. What about wax paper? So wax paper is typically a petroleum byproduct or it's wax. Okay, so there's a lot of contamination with that and it is petroleum based and that's always an issue. So if you can stay away from wax paper, yeah, silicone parchment is better and it acts just like it. I mean, I'll use silicone parchment um, so that it, that is a safer uh, product to use is silicone parchment. Okay, and brown paper bags. Brown paper bags. They should be fine. Um, you shouldn't microwave with them. Um, brown paper bags usually have a re lot of recycled content. So for instance, if you have the food touch it, you're still gonna get contamination. It's not like it's benign because they do have to add uh, additives and things to hold the paper together. Otherwise it would just dissolve. So it's not like it's pu a pure tree, you know? Uh, so um, depending on what you're gonna use it for, if it's, a, if it's a dried sandwich, it's no big deal. But again, if you're going to have something fatty against it or something like that, you, you are going to get contamination from it. So this person understands using glass containers instead of plastic in the microwave. Um, what about for storage? If we put hot food in a Tupperware container and put it in the fridge, is the heat from the food going to draw out the toxins? Yes, it is. Absolutely. So the heat from you know putting in a hot soup into a Tupperware container is going to make um, the migration increase, absolutely. And you're going to be getting microplastics, period. So that, that will definitely happen. What are your thoughts on aluminum foil? So aluminum foil was um, made to be the sort of the, the devil, you know, years ago. And it's turned out that it's not horrible, but it's, you know, it's a metal. So it, it can create issues. They have they have said it is not associated with breast cancer. It is not, they cannot prove that it's associated with Alzheimer's. So they've taken back a lot of that initial science. Um, so it's, and it's also interesting because aluminum, uh, the chemical structure, the size of the molecule is very big. So we actually absorb less than 1%. I think it's like, I don't know, 0.1% percent or 0.01 percent of the aluminum that we're actually exposed to. So we might think we're ingesting a lot, but we're not actually um, uh, absorbing it at, at all through the gut or inhaling or on our skin or anything. So that's kind of nice. It's a large um, chemical. But, you know, if you're going to have an acid uh, against it, like 
you're going to put aluminum foil over a lasagna and you're having it press against the tomato. You lift up the aluminum foil and all of a sudden you see this little puddle of aluminum, liquid aluminum. That's probably not a good idea. So, but if you're, if you have aluminum against, again, a dry sandwich, it's not a big deal. So can you clarify, is it really not safe to drink sparkling water or like Pellegrino um, since they're usually in cans and plastic bottles? Yeah. So it just because it's sparkling water doesn't mean that it's still not a plastic container, that it's still not going to have microplastics or the or the canned that it's in isn't lined with BPA or BPS. Yes, it is. So it is all leaching into that nice seltzer water or mineral water that you're drinking from a can. So yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jennifer, what would you recommend as the best produce bags to purchase for the grocery store for grocery store shopping instead of using plastic bags? Well, they you can get all these wonderful, you know, reusable bags. Um, I mean, that's a that's a big thing. I think you can get them in in most grocery stores. You certainly can purchase them at like Whole Foods or your your local co op or something like that. You can buy them online. So it's it's a thing. They come in different sizes. You know, they're usually cotton, which is kind of nice. Um, you can wash them. And so I would say go the reusable route um, and and do that. But you know, if I go in and buy a bunch of apples, I don't put them in a bag. Oh, they're you know they're rolling all over the place. But that's what I do. And then at the end, when they go through the checkout, I put them in a big bag. But you, I I just don't take a plastic bag. Going back to aluminum foil for a second, is there something else you'd recommend to use for like veggies or fish to line a pan? To line a pan, veg. Oh, okay. I see. Like in a baking pan or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I know we don't want to clean it after we cook, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, if the temperature is not too high, you actually can use silicone parchment paper. Um, but if you're going to get a high temperature, like 400, 450, I'm not sure. Um, you'd have to check and see if there's a temp temperature restriction. I know you can't with wax paper. There's definitely a temperature restriction. Um, so you can use silicone uh, parchment. So that might be uh, better. Or you, again, you just do it the old fashioned way and you grease the heck out of it and then you have to clean it. So sometimes, again, we can't have our cake and eat it too. Sorry, but silicone parchment paper might work. Well, let's talk about cake. And I want cake after this. <laughs> the, so um, there's a company that makes canned beans. This participant buys that says their cans are not lined with BPA, but that they instead use a resin. What kind of resin do you think that would be? And could it be something plant-based and so it's less toxic? Usually your resins are not plant-based. Usually they're still plastic-based. I think there, there's a oleo resin. There's a, I forget the other names. Actually, they were on my slides. Um, I think there are three different kinds of resins, but they're still all plastic-based uh, to my knowledge. Um, and if the company says they use a resin, you should say, well, what one? What kind of resin are you using? And that way you have more information because they really differ. So again, if it's a plastic-based uh, resin, like a nylon or something like that, they call that a resin. That's still plastic-based. That's still going to give you microplastics. Good to know. So what about glass containers that come with plastic lids? Is that safe to use? Oh, yeah. Some of those, <laughs> some of those will have BPA in the... Uh, um, in the part where it seals, sometimes like your ball and mason jars, that's a BPA uh, coating. They've made a big deal. Some other companies have come up with a replacement for that. But yeah, those and sometimes they're phthalates. So yeah, the lids are are um, coated. So yeah, you don't want to shake it and and then or lick you know the lid. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's a that's a concern. And yes, they do leach. They've done studies on them. So. Um, yeah. So don't, you know, if, if the food is caked on, on the inside of the lid, just rinse it off. Don't put it in the soup or whatever. 
So this attendee has um, parchment baking paper that says it is silicone coated. Is that yeah. safe? It does get very hot in the oven. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think silicone parchment can go pretty high in terms of temperature. I would have to Google it to see if there's a max, but I, I think it can go pretty high. Um, but again, you, you are touching the silicone and we talked about that it's not benign. Uh, it's not as bad as plastic, but it is showing endocrine activity in what, 84% of the silicone products. So if you have an endocrine or hormone related cancer, you might want to think twice about that. Um, but, you know, it's it still might be better. Again, the, this isn't black and white. Sometimes categories are okay, better, best. Uh, so I would put silicone parchment in the better category. Great. How are paper towels for wrapping vegetables? Okay, so paper towels, if you have your white paper towels, they've been bleached. So there's going to be some, you know, sloughing off of that chemical on there. Um, but again, yes, paper is the base. They still have to add a lot of additives. So they've bleached it. They have things to hold it together. Um, so it, again, it's not benign. I'd rather you use a, a clean tea towel in all honesty um, than, than the paper. Uh, and then you have unbleached paper. So that's gonna be better. Some paper products have a high recycled content. And again, that sounds great from an environmental standpoint. And I love the idea, but actually they have found that there's a lot of contamination with that. So you do, it, it, paper towels aren't designed for food contact. That's, that's not what they're regulated or designed to do. So perhaps proceed with caution. A few questions about air fryers. Are they safe to use? It depends on what it is. I know some air fryers have Teflon or they're using you know, a Teflon container and some air fryers uh, are stainless steel on the inside. So you definitely wanna go with the stainless steel ones. This next question leans into healthy kitchen category, but I'm gonna ask it anyways with letting people know, if you have questions about um, building your own healthy kitchen, I do recommend downloading the Healthy Kitchen ebook. It is an invaluable resource written by this woman herself. So if you have questions concerning that, we'll do our best to answer them now, but also please download that ebook. Yeah, it's um, great. Is it safe to cook in non-stick pans? Okay, remember the okay, better, best. So, um, so you're not your non-stick or non-PFAS uh, pans are going to be in the better category. So, um, or the okay category. Your best category is definitely going to be your stainless steel, ceramic, and cast iron, without a question. So you, most of the, the green pans and are they silicone based? And as you saw from the research, the research is showing some issues with silicone, okay? So it's better than PFAS, but it's not the best option. What about aluminum utensils? Aluminum utensils. Hmm. Okay. Well, aluminum utensils uh, are aluminum. So they're going to, um, you're going to have exposure or leaching of aluminum into the foods. But again, we don't absorb a lot of it. So if you're going to stir it in tomato sauce, that's an issue. If you're going to stir it in something non-acetic, then it's going to be better. So hopefully that answered the question. Is boxed water healthier than plastic water? Well, your boxed water is still plastic. So the, so the bo anything boxed is a layered um, a, a piece of uh, packaging. So there can be anywhere from four to six layers in it. But the final layer that's against the food is plastic. So um, it's typically, what did I say? It's typically plastic number two, is it? Or number four? So your polyethylene, so it's still plastic. So, um, and you're still getting microplastics. What do you think about ice cube plastic alternatives? Oh, they make stainless steel. They do make silicone, okay? So plastic, silicone, stainless steel or metal. 
That's going to be, you know, the old fashioned metal ones. Yeah, some of them are aluminum. Some of them come in stainless steel now. You can get them and they're pretty cool. That does sound cool. What about uh, the silica packs that come in vitamin bottles and some dry goods? Should we be removing them immediately? Or if they're okay, is it all right to reuse them on um, pantry shelves to keep the area dry? Oh, um, you know, I don't know much about them, but their whole purpose is that they are absorbing things. So I, to my knowledge, they're not discharging anything. So I don't see what the problem is. I don't know much about them. Do you have any suggestions for um, those of us who drinking tap water isn't the cleanest? Um, so instead purchased um, uh, bottled water, how do you recommend switching or making a transition? Yeah. So please stop using bottled water. <laughs> and also um, along the same lines as bottled waters, a lot of people will get the five gallon ones, you know, the blue ones, the, or the ones that are in the office and that that's BPA. So you definitely don't want to get those. So you can filter your own water at home uh, and then take it in a reusable stainless steel container. Uh, and there are companies that make glass um, uh, filter ones. Life, I think it's Life Straw makes it. I, I have it. That's what I use for my water filter. If you have a Brita and it's a polycarbonate, remember contact time. So filter the water, pour it into glass. Okay, that's an alternative. Very little contact time. Don't let it sit there. Don't let it sit in the refrigerator for three days and then drink it. So again, contact time is part of that exposure formula. Right, and I do know they sell regular and sparkling water in um, glass containers at most, most grocery stores. What about, oh, I like this question because I have so many friends, the same thing, new new water in cans instead of bottle people. That's a, all the rage right now. What do you think? Oh, no. La Croix drives me crazy. It's, <laughs> I know, no, all beverage cans are lined with BPA, period. They have not changed yet. And it's only going to be regulation. France has it, uh, I think they have to change. So the industry is going to have to come up with an alternative and it will start, but it's going to start with demanding. I, I want to say the state of Maine is, is making it too. So the companies are going to have to change, but if you keep buying it, they're not going to change. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's called voting with your dollars. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have time everyone for a couple more questions. So if you have a burning cool. one, throw it in the chat or the, or the Q and a now. Um, let me see. What do you think about uh, the food saver machines that you can preserve food at home in? I think, and they can answer me if they're still on. I think they're talking about the the uh, vacuum seal. Is that what they would be talking about? I'm food not saver? sure, but that's what I thought as well. Yeah. So again, it's plastic. So some of those plastics that are used for that are better. Some of them are not like if they're PVC based. So the plastic in those can vary. Um, of course, they're, they're going to have all sorts of additives as well. The bottom line is you're going to be exposed to microplastics. What about rinsing canned beans? Does that help at all? Good question. Um, probably a little, but it's going to be, it, again, if it's, if it has sat on the on the shelf for six months or whatever, it's gonna be all in the beans. Because again, migration chemicals want to create an equilibrium. So it's not gonna stop at the skin, it's just gonna go into the bean. What do you recommend for freezing liquids in? Ball mason jars have come out with some jars that are freezer proof or for lack of a better word. They don't come in big ones, but they come in the smaller ones. And so that is an option. You also, so they aren't, so that's that's a tall packaging. Then you have sort of the, the dishes or the, the small bowls. So Pyrex makes them, Duralex makes them. You can get them stacked. You can get them all sorts of shapes and you can freeze in that very easily. It works great. 
Wonderful. Well, it is 5.15 on the dot. Thank you everyone for participating. If you have a few minutes, please take our survey. We want to know how we did. We want to make these as best as possible for you. Thank you, Deborah, for your expertise. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. With us. All right. I'll see you all hopefully on October, October 17th for our next webinar. Have a good night, everyone.